All right. Hello and welcome. Another Thursday evening, Coach's Corner. My name is Walter Beatty, a.k.a. Baseball Lifer, uh, joined by my co-host, official co-host, uh, Dave Serrano, former head coach of Cal State Fullerton, University of Tennessee. I want to let everybody know uh, we have some new viewers tonight via our Facebook pages, and I want to let everybody know every Thursday evening, this is your spot for Coach Serrano and I to kind of share uh, our thoughts on the game, as well as hear from college coaches, former players, both professionally and collegiately, and kind of gain some insight and education to help families and student athletes that may feel somewhat overwhelmed. So every Thursday evening here at nine o'clock Eastern, we, Dave and I uh, will be talking with a college coach here on our Coach's Corner segment. We're also going to begin to do something uh, starting in a week or two where we're going to kind of do a podcast that's going to do a reflection on the weekend of college baseball, kind of discuss some of the trends, some of the changes that may be occurring within the, the landscape of college baseball with regard to coaching, as well as rule changes. Our guest this evening is no stranger to national championships. When you think college baseball, when you think JUCO baseball, community college, I guarantee you you don't think Western Iowa, Iowa Western. And in 20 years, this coach, Mark Reardon, won three national titles, was in the World Series 12 times, and this is what has earned him the opportunity to become the head coach of the Hilltoppers of Western Kentucky. Mark, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, Walter. I appreciate you and Dave having me on. It's exciting. Well, we're excited, I can tell you that. And I really, uh, you know, I, with Tyler playing at Vanderbilt, I know Western Kentucky makes an annual trip or has made yep. a pretty much annual trip into Nashville. Yep. What is it, what has the transition been like for you going from community college at the Division One JUCO right. Division One into NCAA Division One? Right. Um, it, yeah, there's, there's definitely, there's, there's definitely sometimes stigmas of the junior college and the, the wild, wild west and fly by the seat of your pants. And back in the real back in the days, Juco, it was, right, Dave? I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was a little bit, you know, fly by the seat of your pants if you want. The rules were, were you know, slim and in between. But there's so many of us out there now in, in today's level and junior college level. And then NJCA does such a great job of governing it that um, – it wasn't that big, you know, the number one thing for a lot of people who know me and what some of my reputation is, is like, you know, the lack of hours at the junior college level. I mean, we practiced Monday through Friday seven times because we did two a days on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We lifted four days a week, Monday through Friday, and we played every Saturday and Sunday, whether we were playing outside competition or we just inter squatted. And like last year before, um, before, leaving and coming here my last fall there the first full time the first full week weekend we gave them off was like the first weekend in november uh because i mean it was junior college i'm like if you want to get better then that's why you came to junior college yeah. you don't get better sitting around that's just kind of growing up on a farm that's just kind of how it was so and i never wanted to shortchange them now so people are like i don't know how you're going to do that you can't do that stuff at division one i'm like well no kidding I'm 51 years old. Like, I get it. Um, uh, but a lot of my practice formats and what we did, team drills that included offense, defense, base running, just so much in, in one uh, one drill is really set for Division I. Uh, um, you know, smaller number <clears throat> roster, um, less time at practice, but yet the efficiency of what I always say, use, use both sides of the baseball. A lot of times, you know, if you think of a baseball, people just like often just hit, hit and base run, and they're lacking defense. They're lacking pitchers backing up or whatever you're doing. I always try to think, like, try to use both sides of the baseballs and how many drills so you're getting both sides, and there's just the efficiency of it and game life. So a lot of that has been set up to this. Um, you know, I, I get caught on a little bit of dead time for myself to where now I'm just focusing on more of something else, whether it's recruiting whether it's getting, you know, the Diamond Club uh, booster, uh, boosters going, 
Um, we're upgrading facilities. I'm putting a lot of time into that. But taking over a program that has been um, lower end, dormant, whatever you want to say, for the last eight, nine years, um, I wouldn't have been able to do it like 12, 13, 14 years ago. Um, I, I, I wouldn't still be equipped enough. Uh, I always joke with people, but yet I'm not joking. I was kind of a late bloomer when it comes to maturity. My wife would probably tell you I still am, but <laughs> I, I wouldn't have been able to handle just so much, whether it's the losing, right? You know, battling that a little bit more when you first take over, really just mindset, just how they roll out of bed, how they're thinking, what they talk about, you know, everything like that. That's probably been what has been the most fun for me because that's how I built Iowa Western, but it's also the most tiring. It's it's fun, but tiring is I'm starting <clears throat> over with what we call a living, breathing culture, not just how we play the game, run out balls, get your bunts down, whatever. We're talking about how you roll out of bed and how you do everything. There's, I mean, Dave would say it and every other, man, that it, it matters. And when people mm -hmm. don't think it matters, that's not a winning team. That's not a winning program. So that stuff matters. So that's where I'm at right now, Walter, with just with this program. And I don't, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it years ago. And I've been fortunate. I, I don't know how many junior college guys, especially nowadays has had this opportunity, but I've already been offered two other division one jobs in like the last eight years. And that's just unheard of. I was so fortunate even to have that chance. And for different reasons, I turned them down. And, you know, I really just figured that window was closed. Like I had my opportunities, but it just wasn't the fit just to say I'm the Juco guy that went division one. And then you put yourself in a bad situation. So I just didn't do it. And then this came up and I knew about this place and I've had seven or eight program or kids come to this program for my junior college and they all enjoyed their time here in the school and community. So that helped as well. So, um, you know, long, long answer, uh, I, you know, I, I it, it's a change, but at 51 and 27 years of coaching, it's not like, like just totally anything caught me off guard. Um, before I ask you uh, my question, Mark, first of all, I'm very honored to be on here with you. I'm going to answer your question of how many guys, I'm going to give you two names. I'm going to put a little pressure on you. Wayne Graham went from junior college at San Jacinto to Rice. And oh yeah. He was pretty successful. George Horton, my mentor, went from Cerritos College to Absolutely. Cal State Fullerton. So I'm going to give you someone to – those two guys to follow in their in their tracks because yeah. those are two successful guys. But I, first I, of all, I, congratulations on your start of the season. I, I noticed, um, like you said, the program's been a little dormant. And, you know, you guys have already won seven games, and they won 18 total last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. You had a glorious winning percentage in at, at Iowa Western of 868. And Walter already talked about all your – championships and appearances in the college world series or in the junior college world series my question is i saw you got the job on june 15th and i think it's important for the listeners to hear as a coach taking over a program especially a program that hasn't been winning um when you got there okay i'm sure you probably had guys in the transfer portal that were currently supposed to be on your team yep so you have to save them how did you construct your roster and what were you allowed to do with your roster of a team that didn't win a lot of games last year were you able to make some moves and did you have to go out and get players because it's late it's late in recruiting yeah. on june 15th yeah. and and how did you go out and find your guys well so a couple things um you know i i got to hear kind of get behind that curtain and you hear about culture or whatnot <clears throat> what, what what was already been going on here and then the players that were here players that were in the portal that i did call um i think we lost like four um, two that were real substantial, you know, if, if you were looking on paper, it's like, you know, it, that we'd like to have those guys, um, you know, when you're, when you're not winning a lot, uh, like they were here and then you just had 18 wins, um, and now you're getting a new coach, you know, you would think maybe with the new coach, you'd get a few more of the mm -hmm. maybe higher, you know, some of the, the, the higher ups in the, in the portal, um, because we know not everybody is in the portal is just going to fit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for different reasons. And I, I just wasn't being able to have like a, a, a big quality selection. Uh, now, the one thing I don't think some people know and a lot of people don't know is I didn't cut anybody. I Anybody who wanted to stay, I kept this year. 
my athletic director, you know, when he was hiring me, Todd Stewart um, said, I I'm looking for uh, energy and I'm kind of an energy guy. If you can tell, I'm sitting on my chair, rolling back and forth, got my hand going everywhere. And I could do this for three hours if you wanted to. So um, I'm an energy guy. He was looking for culture and he was looking for player development. And those are kind of just, just kind of spells my name right there. So um, I was keeping whoever wanted to stay. So we have like 19 return that were on this team last year. Um, we were able to get, um, I brought one with me, a left-handed pitcher who, who uh, comes out of our pen this year. He's a sophomore. And then uh, uh, Coach Fournier from Wabash, he was there for like 26 years, great junior college program out of Illinois. He's my recruiting coordinator. He was my, uh, he was my second hire after my pitching coach who came with me from Iowa Western. Well, he had some guys that played for him that were in the portal for, uh, that were in the, you know, out of the SEC and some other places. And so we, we, we just kind of piece it. It looks like my grandma's quilt. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you got the old yeah. here and you got a pair yeah. of old shorts here and you just kind of sew them all together. And that's what we are. And uh, the number one thing for me was just the kids that wanted to be here. You know, yeah. my athletic director said year one is actually year zero. Like just do what you need to do, get started. Um, you know, we were in a little bit of disarray on the field, off the field, whatever. And so, he, you know, he just said year year one is actually year zero to start, which is great. Um, but, you know, we only take that so far. Right. We, we're, we're, we're worrying about right now. But I just I I couldn't be real picky, Dave, in, in the portal. I mean, who's who's necessarily knocking down our door? And honestly, in the future, I don't know how much we can um, how much we can really rely on that either. I mm -hmm. think. A place like this, a mid-major, which can be a good mid-major. We're in a great conference. Conference yes. USA is a baseball conference. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I could probably get lashed back for making that comment right there But uh, from other people. But it's a it's a baseball conference to me. I, I mean, the, the quality of play is inc incredible. Um, but I, I don't think that we can just rely on, on getting on the portal, guys, when there's just so many – that can just sit there and pick like crazy. Yeah. Uh, so we got to be careful that way. I think junior college, you know, this again, this is a junior college transfer uh, conference. If you look at everybody's rosters and the success of programs and just who's really your staples in, in your lineup and things like that. So we've done really well there. We're top five in the country right now in recruiting with junior college and we've really killed it that way. And so I, I you know, Early on in the future, I don't know, maybe some more people want to be on board and we snap, uh, get a couple more in the portal. But I'm really proud of the guys that stayed here and they're they're buying in. They want to win. Yeah, they yeah. want. So, and, so Mark, Mark, tell me something real quick. Yeah. You know, you, you so you take over this program, you get off to a really good start. And that's obviously something that you can use to your advantage with regard to recruiting. Yeah. Getting a lot of parents, a lot of student athletes that are sending this question. Are you a camp guy? Do you want to see video? How do we get our guys in front of the Hilltopper staff? Um, you know, we know sure. they're in Kentucky, but maybe share a little what makes Western Kentucky unique, what makes it different, and what makes it stand out as a potential uh, landing place for student athletes. Sure. Um, uh, Bowling Green's in a great area, first and foremost. I mean, our midweeks on Tuesdays are all less than two hours which Dave, that's huge, right? I mean, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kids are in bed by 1030, uh, you know, and getting up and going to class the next day and not dragging. So uh, that's always big, but um, it, it's, it's a university town. Bowling Green is kind of like a bigger Starkville, you know, kind of format where the, the town is, is Western Kentucky uh, university. So um, they're, they're just so supportive uh, that way. But for, for me, uh, we've done really well this fall with the, uh, sh with the high school showcase camps that we ran. We've actually signed, uh, I want, I know three for sure. I'm wanting to say four, but we've signed three for the future committed three, uh, at least out of that. So, you know, that was obviously more local kids, uh, within, uh, a state or two. And then videos, I mean, nowadays video is just crazy with what you can see video just before you, um, really reach out to them or really start going deeper into them. You can, 
you can see so much um, between the, the, the high school. I, I think what's a neat thing that we sell is we're really limited in roster. Our roster is a 40 man roster. So when I'm sitting there talking to parents, I'm like, Listen, we're going to have 40 guys on the team. I mean, you're not going to show up and there's 56 guys. And I think that that's huge. Uh, again, I'm a parent as well, a 21 year old that pitches at a four year, at a division two, four year school. And I have a 16 year old son that's a sophomore in high school that wants to be a, a college player. So that would be big to me too, um, is the limitations, what we have uh, with, with our roster size to start with. So that might hurt me a little bit because I'd like to carry a couple more with arms because of injuries and guys that just maybe need the red shirt, but we can't. And so I turn it the other way and be like, listen, you're going to you show up here and uh, you got way higher chances. Um, I think also with being a longtime junior college guy, which means incredible development and my whole pitch, my whole staff, my pitching coach who came with me, he was at three years with me at Iowa Western and is now here. Um, just development, incredible development on the mound. And then Coach Fournier, who was 26 years as the head coach at Wabash. Uh, junior college in Illinois that is always top five, top 10 in the country. Uh, he comes in my recruiting guy, my hitting guy, my infield guy. And so you're talking about development. We're development guys. And I still think, especially today with Portal, um, PBR, uh, Perfect Game, everything like that, people just get all the talent. And there's not necessarily coaching going on. We, we talked about Corbin real quick with my relationship with him at Vanderbilt. And he's still a huge teacher. And so am I. And it's not just, wow, I got all this talent. My talent beats your talent on the roster. Here we go. No, like there's still development going on. And that's what we always want our parents and the kids know coming here is that yeah, you're talented, but you've got a better future than you are talented right now. And you just need to develop. And that's the person, the student and the athlete. And I think that that's just what people need to know that they get with WKU. I, Mark, I love I love those words from your your mouth. That that's I mean you're right. Not many people are doing that anymore, and it's just let's get all the talent and the best the, the cream will rise to the top. I think it would be interesting for our listeners on here to hear this um, from you. And I know every school and coach is going to handle this differently, but kind of break down your eleven point seven on as a coaching staff when you sit down and talk recruiting. Where is the majority of your money going um, that, that you're handing out to, yeah. to the recruits that are bringing in? Yeah. That when, you're bringing in. When you and I would have a team, you know, first day of practice and we go, okay, everybody run out to your position. Everybody runs out to catcher, <laughs> pitcher, shortstop, center field. Yeah. I mean, that's the reality of it, you know? Yeah. So that's that's a lot of what you're doing. And all of a sudden, you know, you got that shortstop and you're like, no, Jimmy, you need to go over to third base. You're going to end up being 6'3 and 220 pounds and be a, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. we'll center fielder. No, dude, you need to be a left fielder. You don't actually run as well or whatever. Um, so going back to, you know, the middle of the field, I mean, you obviously got to have a guy that can catch and throw and block and handle pitching. Um, whether you're eight years old or you're, 30 years old and in the big leagues, the mound is what matters. That's the beautiful thing about our game is that mound matters, whether you're little Timmy or you're the big guy, you know, at in, in the MLB. I mean, the mound is where it's at. So there's a lot that goes, there's a majority of it that's going to go there. Uh, you're going to have a shortstop. Um, you're going to, you know, so we're, we're talking the middle of the field because your center fielder is, you know, probably a leadoff guy actually goes and gets the ball your shortstop obviously great communicator obviously can play handle the ball uh he's probably a two hole or 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 you know six hole type guy catchers in the middle lineup the big first baseman i think i'm no different than a lot of other places and again taking this job um we have great uh opportunities on the back side of 11.7 with uh you know reciprocity with other state yeah. academics yeah. Uh, things like that. And I, I think that that's just still where baseball continues to go is those academics are big, man. Like mm -hmm. baseball players just aren't, you know, those, those dumb little guys running around. I mean, you nowadays, the higher you want to play, um, the smarter you need to be, um, whether it's going to be what money you get. 
I mean, we give, we can give a guy, say we give a guy, you know, that, that 25 or 30% and then whatever they get on the backside, I mean, they can still get like 75% from us, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, the, so those types of things are what's big. So it's gotta be, um, but I mean, some of your best players, some of your best stories, Dave, and your, all your years of coaching is that walk on. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And I think what I think what people don't understand, Mark, and I, I think you answered that perfectly, is that parents got to understand that when you're being approached by a coach and to not get offended if they're getting offered very little money because their son's a first baseman or maybe a corner outfielder. It's what we have in the bank. And I think it's safe to say that what you just explained is probably seven point five to about nine percent or up to nine scholarships is going to the positions you talked about. Absolutely. Catching, shortstop, pitching, and center field, and um, there's not much left. Um, so it's it's smaller portions, but I think they got to understand that as an organization, you're trying to be strong up the middle. I know, and it, like sometimes you know you're like, I I'm sorry you're disappointed in me, but you got to be more disappointed in the NCAA. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, sorry. I mean, <laughs> this it, it's it's just what we have right now, and um, people can call, you know what we have or what other people have and you got like the funny money or whatever i just call it the back end money right the the, mm -hmm. the the um and we're fortunate to have some so we do get really good kids we do get really smart kids because they like what they're getting here so you know that's part of our recruiting a lot of times is you know hey this kid's good you see him on video like you guys said it gets sent to us they're at our camp whatever you know and you see him okay obviously he catches your eye the ability and then you look at grades and then you look at what mom and dad do. And I mean, let's be honest. Right. And then you try to pin it's pencil to paper with what money you have for the position, uh, what academic money he gets with that. And now how can we come in in the back end scholarship wise and make this work for us and them? Right. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about the back end money academically or, or state reciprocities and stuff like that. But let's be honest, we, we back end on the scholarship to make this work, you know, if yeah. they're already getting, you know, 48% on academics and whatever, then what do we need to make this work for us? Paper, uh, pencil to paper, because we get still got three other guys to recruit. And how can we make this work for this kid in the family? Yeah. So Mark, it, it's not perfect, is it? Right. It doesn't always no, work. No, right. No, no, no. It doesn't always work the way families want it to work, but sometimes they just don't have a good understanding as to the realities and the finite number of scholarships that have to be broken up currently amongst the 27, you know, student yeah. athletes. So I, I have to ask, where do you fall? A lot of kind of whispering going on that April when the committee gets together, division one committee uh, with regard to when they can begin contact with the student athlete and when a student athlete can be extended a scholarship offer, you know, there's a whisper going on that that may be kind of towing the line with softball and lacrosse. Are you in favor of that or would you rather just keep it status quo? Well, let, let, let me, let me give you this situation as well, because again, I'm a parent with, with a sophomore in high school. It's a talented little guy, but um, I, I'm, I was a junior college guy. Why are were all these, and we were averaging nearly 20 guys a year going division one. Okay. So well, how are all these guys going division one when all these guys, all these schools are committing all these guys as freshmen, <laughs> sophomores, right. but, but then all of a sudden I got guys that are available to go to those places. You know, there's so, something's getting siphoned out somewhere, right? Some, something's losing out. So I'm, I'm not the biggest on the freshman or sophomore thing. I get it. Hey, listen, we have, we have a freshman in high school committed <laughs> to us um, that that was kind of a, a worked in so many other avenues to make it work to why he wanted to be here in the future. But um, I, I would I would really like for the kids to be able to enjoy high school a little bit more and not be consumed with that. I to me I think it just really. Um, falls into place. I mean, I've st I still tell people like if you're a player and you haven't been recruited your freshman and sophomore year, 
and your junior year, you just maybe got a little bit, but nothing really bit, but you keep getting better. You keep getting strong. I promise you, someone will still offer you. Right. I promise. It's just, you know, well, we're not recruiting that class anymore. We're done with that class. And that's going to happen in the SEC, Big 12, ACC. But even then, it doesn't necessarily all always happen because those same conferences was were recruiting my kids every year. And they're the, you know what I mean? So yeah. um, I, I'm not big, you know, the, 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 the earlier you get to contact them, I don't think is the answer uh, overall. And I, I, I get it that we want to recruit and we don't want to miss out on the kids, but I think it's, I think first and foremost, I want it to be about my kid. Right. Uh, I don't want it to be about my program or, or whoever's program. I, I, you know, I, I really don't have much to say on, I, I'm giving you my oversight of being a parent and having a kid and, and now I'm in this business, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think that it needs to be any earlier. I don't think it needs to be, um, rushed any more than I think it already is getting to. I mean, we, we're, we're, we're recruiting eighth graders now for God's sakes. Mm-hmm. You know, you brought up the Conference USA, and I've always had a lot, a ton of respect for Conference USA. It's, it's a really spread out conference. Um, so my question to you, staying with the recruiting theme, is because you're one of the more northern schools in Conference USA, yeah. how, do you, how do you use that when you're hitting the pavement and the road re- out recruiting? Because I'm sure people are using that against you. Yeah. So what are you going to do to counterdict that? And the other thing is, because how much the, it – conference you say is spread out obviously that probably helps you to go into louisiana and find a guy in florida to find a guy doesn't it yeah in atlanta it really does we have mm-hmm. a lot of success in atlanta um you look at southern you look at illinois you look at indiana where we're having a ton of success kentucky um you know where um this program just hadn't really been in people's ears that much uh, in the past and, um, you know, so we've, we've been having success there, uh, Missouri right beside us. Um, uh, again, you're talking to the guy that came that was yeah. plus yeah. For 20 yeah. years and was always in the top 10 and winning national championships in baseball. That's a Southern sport. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we're full turf here. We have our own indoor hitting facility, 24 hour access. Um, it's, you know, we're home the first four weekends uh, because I get Northern Division ones to come down here to play us uh, that, that are above us. Um, I, I, it's too early on right now for me, Dave, to say that we're getting beat recruiting wise. That has not come up one time with, with other with other programs in our conference. That hasn't come up yet in any of my staff meetings that that has we've got that feeling or heard that, you know, but. I'm sure it will. I mean, it did for me at Iowa Western. Why would you want to go play up there, you know, and and things like that? So I, I'm sure it could. So, but I, I'm not worrying about it right now because I think with our location, we can still get kids. Um, and like I said, we're we're getting kids from Atlanta. We got commits from Atlanta, Nashville area, stuff like that. Um, I tell you what, when you are, and especially. The, the, the reputation of Cal State Fullerton in your town, ta- just ball players, man. Mm-hmm. Just ball players. Guys that, well, don't, it, guys that don't care. Yeah, and I'm going to say this, Mark. Uh, I think for anyone that's listening, um, you've said it at least five or six times on how much you emphasize development. Yeah. And when we were at Cal State Fullerton, we got beat yeah. by a lot of people around us, the SCs, the UCLA. I'm talking in recruiting. Yeah. But we they rarely beat us on the field back then. And it was because of development. And I think any player that. Oh. We lost you, Dave. I don't think he, I don't think he knows we lost his, but Dave, if you can hear us somehow, we lost your, your, your audio there. I don't know if you fix that. There, Dave. Nope. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to try to fix that. I have a quick question. That's a yeah. Dave Serrano question. Dave is, is famous for saying how you do anything is how you do everything. Did I yep. lose you guys? Yep. There you go. You're back. Uh, you got me now. Um, but I'm just going to ask it real quick. Um, you, you talk on this topic as far as culture. And I have a parent that asked a question when these student athletes are in, in high school, how important is it for them to understand 
routine, daily disciplines. Because, again, using Dave's quote, how you do everything is how you do everything. And so high school students think there's a switch you can just flip when you get to college and you just become this mature uh, student. But in reality, it, it begins in that junior and senior year of high school and it carries over into college. Would you agree? I, I think parents need to know that they need to start working with their kids when they're freshmen and sophomores. Uh, BBL, right? Bad body language. Um, how they roll out of bed. Like he said, how you do anything is how you do everything. I talk about it's not about how you roll out on the field. It's how you roll out of bed and just just your mannerisms and, and, the, and the effort, you know, and things like that. And I think it has to start your freshman and sophomore year because you just can't be waiting till you're a junior or senior and then you're fighting bad habits or anything like that. So um, because I, the, it, the, I talk about the world, but we're talking about baseball within that world. But just the, 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 the team, the, the, the bad body language or positive body language, just the effort um just the communication the talk the positive talk the 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 volume of the talk um i i'm every all that matters i all that matters i i know it mattered to dave i know it matters to tim corbin i know it matters to to schlossnagel at a and m and you know dan mcdonald at louisville those guys like i know it matters and and any of the people that are out there listening would you know would love to go to those places way more than western kentucky and what <laughs> Kentucky does the same thing as well. My wife and I do the same thing, same talk. Um, you know, my my living room is basically like the same talk as my locker room. And my locker room here is like the same talk my wife and I have had raising two sons. And so I tell parents that you, you can't start early enough about just positive energy, body language, how your kids act, things like that. I mean, Again, let's go back to my junior college days. I, I I could pick a way more, right? I wasn't just kind of taking a really good ball player. I call them hooks. People just take a really good ball player, but then the other 95%, they're just they're, they're going to kill you, right? They help you three hours on the field, but 21 other hours, they're killing you. Well, I, I just, I, I don't do it, and I won't do it here. You know, I mean, we recruit. I always say we recruit certain kids from certain families, and what do I mean when I say that? My wife hates it when I say that. She goes, I don't think that's politically correct. But what I mean by that when I say it is when a kid knows, you know, when his mom and dad say, hey, man, you're home at midnight or you need to call us before that. I mean, th those things are going to happen. And when they have brought them up to be a good teammate, when they bring them up, when they raise them uh, about having commitment, like if practice is Wednesday, then we're going to go to practice. And then that way you play on the weekend. In today's world, Walter, we're hearing about, and, and again, we were part of this as parents and watching other families. A kid wouldn't go to practice on Tuesday and Thursday, and the parents were still waiting in the parking lot to talk to coach on Saturday, wondering why Timmy didn't play. Are you kidding me? Like, that's the world we live in. And so if it's already going by the time they're seventh and eighth graders, it's going to be hard when they're sophomores and juniors to be recruited uh, positively by so many people, um, which is what they want. They want a lot of opportunities. I, that's the same thing I want with my own two sons. I want them to have opportunities, good grades, good person, you know, good energy. Now you're going to have more opportunities. And people don't think of it that way. They just look for a opportunity when they actually have the world in their hands where they can create a lot of opportunities for themselves in a lot of different ways. Dave, can you hear us now, Captain? No, you can't. Maybe Dave still can't hear us. Can't hear us. Oh, that's a bummer. Okay. <laughs> well, so now, Mark, I'm going to take a couple more questions if I can from parents because you got people on a roll here. Oh, do I? Oh, yeah. I mean, here's a question from a mom. Okay. So uh, somebody's from out of the Western Kentucky area, uh, they come to your camp. Uh, so they're not from the states that you just mentioned, and they sure. might be from someplace geographically that's not in close proximity. Okay. And, they're, and they're turning their 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 child over to you. Are you. How do you get to know that student athlete? How do you develop rapport? Is it via email introduction? Is it a, a video correspondence? How do these student athletes or these families capture your attention 
to get on Western Kentucky's radar? Sure. I mean, we're, we're either seeing them. We're either seeing them in a tournament somewhere. We're either seeing them at our showcase. We're either seeing them on video from a coach sending it to us or the kids sending it. All the video that gets sent to us does get looked at. Um, uh, and, you know, does it mean that necessarily gets re- all of it gets replied to? No, absolutely not. But if we see something that works and we're intrigued, without a doubt, and then pretty much after that, it is, it's calls and texts. It's calls and texts. Not I, I'm not an email guy, really. I'm a call guy. I'm a call guy. And then I even like to FaceTime them. Uh, and because uh, nothing irritates me more, I try to call a kid and he doesn't answer. Then I text him and he texts me right back. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? You know what I mean? Like, you know, because they don't, they're just, they don't like to, they just want to text. And again, that, that's going to turn him off. And it, I mean, or turn people off and it doesn't necessarily mean it right away, but I'm just saying that's, that's a start to it. Um, so they got to be able to talk, they, you know, and, and that's big force. That's big force. And again, I think the game is evolving to where the person matters, you know, the player gets our attention, but the person matters. So being able to talk, being able to answer questions with more than three words and being able to carry on conversation those types of things um that's 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 big for us but you know that i i believe that's big for a lot of the programs nowadays and and i that is such perfect timing i when i talk to families i talked i had a conversation this evening with a parent and i try to stress the importance of proper communication. Well, let, let me tell you this, Walter. Let me tell you this too. You're talking about parents and communication. I don't need parents emailing me. Oh, I don't. I don't need parents emailing me about Timmy. Like I need Timmy to email me. I need his high school coach. I need somebody like that. I don't need the coach. I mean, I don't need the parent. And I'm a parent. Love parents. I'm just saying, I need the kid to do it. This is almost as if you've been reading all of my questions that came in earlier today, because I try to stress that it's the student athlete that's going to be playing for four years, not mom or dad. I'm a parent. Dave's a parent. You're a parent. We, I mean, we yeah. love our children, but we can't play anymore. I, at least I what, can't. I'm, I'm yeah. the oldest. What, the what I've here. learned about college is, it, you know, it's, it's a privilege, not a right for kids to play. And it, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can be demeaning or you can treat them a certain way or, question skin color or sexuality or whatever that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about you know they just think they got all the rights in the world right you know what i mean when when it's a privilege not a right that's that's basically just how the 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 law reads it to if they really don't like it then walk away type of thing um but the same you know in that same kind of fashion is what i'm talking about with, with the parents just wanting to be involved right from the beginning. Now, what you should be doing is pushing your son to do it. And I've also gone as far as to tell parents, if you're even pushing the kid to do it, does he even really want to do it? Does he want to do it? You know, I mean, so I know you love it for him as a parent, but do does does he care about that? Um, and I that's the way I look at it. And I've many times have called dads out on that, that they are, they are, doing their due diligence as a parent and helping and trying, but they're way over what they should be doing. And I just bluntly ask them, I'm like, you need to just flat out sit your son down and ask him how much he really loves this and how he wants to do it. Because if that's the case, if he was calling me or emailing me a third of what you're doing, I would be intrigued to talk with him and see what this is about. You know what I mean? Type of thing. This, this is invaluable. I think this segment alone, I think every parent should be really grateful that you're hearing from a, a coach with 26 years of experience as a baseball coach telling you, if you simply prepare your children to interact, communicate, converse, uh, be able to carry a conversation, it's going to help them so much. Uh, not only with regard to recruiting, but the world as a whole, whether it's for employment, whether it's for academics, uh, sooner or later, public speaking or conversation 
Even when, though it's a lost art, it, it definitely plays yeah. when, a big role. When we have recruits on campus and the, and the parents are with them and, and people think we do, and I've done this for years. I did it at my junior college, I, and we do it here. And parents think we do it to, to ooh and ah them. But all of my players, whether we're around campus and they see us, they will they will purposely walk over and introduce themselves to the mom and dad and the kid. And they have a warm, right? They have a warm look to them, a smile, and a quick, how are you doing? Shake their hands, eye contact. Where are you from? We call it, you know, just that elevator conversation, that that minute talk. And it's not really to impress recruits. It really isn't at all. I'm actually doing life, what I call life survival skills for my players because they got to get comfortable of, to walking up to a complete stranger and introducing themselves and just having a quick conversation. There's a lot of people that get hired in that elevator or get, you know, are remembered in that elevator because of the, just that brief conversation and that's that's why I do that type of stuff. And I've, I've for years, I've called them life survival skills, you know, just those little things like that. Um, and that's what, you know, we still do. We do it here now as our kids will come up. They'll see us with them. You don't walk the other way. You don't avoid it. You get comfortable with walking up to grown adults, the mom and dads, and then a, a, a future, hopefully a student athlete and just saying hi and having a ha good handshake and, and talking. With them. And I think that's invaluable. Well, I want to personally say thank you. I, I know uh, we lost Dave's audio. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he would want to extend because uh, this is really fascinating information that you were able to share. We didn't have to go down the road of, you know, what I call typical baseball college talk. We really explored a few new areas of college baseball that I think parents, it was really insightful. So, Mark, well, thank you very, very much. No problem. And again, just and I've said it five or six times. I'm a parent too. I have one that's a senior in college. We redshirted him at my junior college. My wife and I, you know, we, we just when, when he was deciding on a school in junior college and he grew up there, right? We still gave him the tour around campus, still sat down and talked with him, gave him the option if he wanted to go other places, stuff like that. When he got recruited to central Missouri, we went down his mom and dad and just kind of, um, you know, stayed out of the way. I, I've done it. And, and again, have a sophomore in, in high school and going to be doing it all over again. So the two biggest hypocrites in my life are coaches and parents, and I'm both. Okay. <laughs> so just people need to realize that they're, they're, they're the biggest hypocrites. And again, like I said, man, I'm putting myself right in there. And my wife and I, the more we've admit, known that, seen it, admitted it, right? We become better. We become better talk in the car with the, with, with our 16-year-old around the living room, whatever it is. And, and um, one more thing I'll tell you, and I think it's not used enough and it's not defined enough, is kids aren't tough enough anymore. And what I mean by tough is not just adversity and being able to handle it in positive body language and talk and effort. But I'm talking about tough to walk up to say to somebody and say, I'm sorry, that tough or, or to, to say, I love you or thank you or walk over to somebody and say, hey, do you need help right now instead of walking away because you don't want to be part of it? I think the the tough is being lost. And that's just how I grew up. And I used to think tough was the other way. Right, Walter? I mean, you know, you know, getting hit by a pitch or playing hurt or all that. And that's what kids still might think. But around here, I teach them what tough really means. And it just, it means everything. You know, whether you need to tell somebody you love them, and that's kind of hard for some people to do, but you got to be tough enough to be able to do it or tough enough to accept that you're coming off the bench and be tough enough to work harder if you don't want to just come off the bench or if you're not getting recruited by enough people um, and you want to complain about it or defend or deny why you're not, you just need to get tougher. That's well, the way I, I, think, I think more people that are within the youth baseball landscape, if they were teaching that method, really that mindset of being mentally tough, you know, being prepared to accept and excel in your role and what it takes to truly be a part of a team. Uh, if we did that at younger ages, I think it's kind of a lost that mental toughness 
Oh man. It's really something that we, we don't challenge the student athletes enough to overcome. We create uh, another outlet we create another uh, right. roadway and, and rather than saying okay you have to go through it over it under it i don't care but you have to deal with this obstacle we just yeah. kind of in turn say let's create another road let's create another path yeah. let's create another team and that's really how baseball is kind of fast becoming this unorganized organized youth sport if that makes any sense well we we talk about positivity and hey it'll be okay which i get it but I've always said my positivity is that you get to roll out of bed the next day and do something about it. You can just keep saying it's going to be all right, and you're going to have to keep wearing it, right? Because, I mean, you're not really doing much other than, hey, it's going to be all right. No, the positivity is that you get to show up and do something about it the next day. You know, the practice, the you know, a game, whatever, especially in baseball, right? You get to play it every day. So it isn't just the positivity of, well, it's not, it wasn't our day today. Well, maybe fundamentally we weren't tough enough and we just we were we didn't stay locked in the whole day. We weren't tough enough. Like I said, I think it is the word that's not defined good enough in so many ways and it's not used the right way. We we we, we throw it around there kind of like grind and grit or whatever. Um, but I just don't think it's defined and held at the standard it needs to be for tough. And, you know, you. You know, for me, like I said, um, it's a big thing we've been on our kids. It's just energy can be there any every day. The positive positivity to, to work can be there every day. And mentally is where everything starts. Everything starts and ends every day with your men mentality and what you want to choose to do. And again, that goes circles back around to toughness to me how tough do you want to be that day how tough do i want to be now after being somewhere for 20 years and raising a family and winning more than anybody like in the last 11 years at any college level now all of a sudden i pick up my whole family and move somewhere where i don't know how to drive around i don't know where to go to get a stapler for my office on campus i don't know anything and i got to get comfortable with uncomfortable and that's what we had to do as a family as well and so we talked about all that and there's toughness that has to be involved with that. And um, th there's so many of my little rarenisms, as we call them, that I, I that are just that, that they are life survival skills. You know, we all have to have an ego to drop our ego. Dave and I, we've gotten older, have definitely been able to have an ego to drop our ego more when we were younger and coaching and thought we had the world figured out. Um, we were still getting humbled and you either go through life you know, humble or being humbled. And I've been humbled enough to now be very humble about it all. I, I know that I, I, Dave, we heard your microphone. Can you still hear us? Not hear us, Dave? <laughs> nope. You still can't hear us. No. Nope. Well, I will tell you this. I want to, first of all, thank you very, very much for your time. I have about 30 people that have all said the most energetic, the most authentic, this is the most we've learned in the, the you know, all of the weeks you've been doing this. So you, got, you got no idea about energy. I'm trying to stay calm. So I, <laughs> this, is, I, this is just kind of how I, again, this is, this is the only thing I know in life. I mean, I mean, I, I just, you know, God had a plan for me and I didn't know it at the time, fell into it. And uh, I've gotten, I've gotten really good at, you know, having an ego to drop my ego and, and teach young men. And, uh, not, you know, we talked about some stuff with parents, man, and I know I was getting real with parents, and I just want you guys all know out there, this is this is opinions from a guy who's one of the, those one of two hypocrites, right? Parents and coaches, and uh, so it, it really comes from experience for me. It's just not an opinion because I'm a coach, um, and I'm not the easiest guy to play for. I'm going to tell you that, and a lot of people in baseball world know that with me. My energy and my positivity and stuff, it comes in a different direction. Um, kids just need to know that you care about them. It's really like raising kids. You're worried they're not home by midnight. They haven't called you yet. Thank God they walked through the door. Why didn't you call me? Now I'm going to kill you. Right? I'm, I'm glad you're home. I love you to death, but I'm going to kill you. That's coaching. I'm a stepdad, but I'm not their dad. You know, try to help them out. And that's 
That's what we try to do, and that's what I'm trying to do tonight. Without hopefully not making anybody mad, Walter. Uh, as no, I, I don't think so. I think at the end of the day, every parent has really gotten a lot out of this discussion this evening, and it's a shame that we lost Dave because I know he, he had some great questions for you. A lot okay. of synergy there as a JUCO coach. Go ahead, coach. Yeah. I want to say thank you to you, Mark. Best of luck to the Hilltoppers, except when they roll into Nashville uh, in April. I, I understand. <laughs> and I want to let parents know, a couple parents have asked, this is a baseball blue book uh, BP jersey. Going to get Coach Serrano one of these bad boys. We do this on behalf of the baseball blue book. That is an app that's a free app that you are able to download. It's a directory. Uh, it's more than a directory. The app is exactly all baseball all the time. So if you're looking for a social media interaction between coaches, athletes, instructors, equipment companies, it's the Blue Book. You can go to any Google Play Store, Apple iTunes, all those, wherever you download your apps, you can get the Blue Book. Dave and I are going to begin our our additional college weekly breakdown, probably when conference play starts, once coach gets his microphone and uh, proper equipment, we'll be able to do that on our podcast next week on Thursday, 9 PM. Dave and I will be speaking with Tom Walter of Wake Forest, the head coach at Wake Forest the following week, which is the 16th of March. We'll be talking to Bill Decker of Harvard university. So we're trying to bring you coaches from all across the country. I know Dave is working on some coaches from the West Coast. This is the place where the coaches hang out. We encourage you to join us every single Thursday evening. I'm going to say goodbye for Coach Serrano, who is not able to speak on the microphone. Mark, thank you. Have a great rest of your week. I know you this weekend you are at home. Yep, yep, yeah. We have Northern Illinois here for four. Great, great series. If you're in Bowling Green, if you're in the Western Kentucky area, go ahead, take in a ball game. Mark, thank you very much. Coach, I'll give you, I'll give you a shout in a second. I'm going to say Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, guys.